Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're continuing on in our study, our survey through Acts. Thank you for joining us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So, gr so very grateful and thankful for the opportunity that you've given us just to hold this book in our hands. Your, your word in our hands and to study it, to feast together on it. We ask that you guide us into all truth. We know that you are our teacher, our comforter. I ask that you filter out all of that which is foolish, that which comes uh, of from the flesh, uh, all of that, anything that is carnal, anything that is untrue, filter that out, seal to our hearts only that which is truth in order that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now when we left off in our last uh, uh, look at uh, Acts here, we were looking, we saw how Apollos, a very educated man, was actually learning from Priscilla. And this is how God works. I'm going to pick up at verse 27. Uh, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. Verse 27, grace. Verse 28, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And that ended chapter 18. Chapter 19, uh, verse 2, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? That's a bad translation. When you believed. That's not waiting for something to happen to them, but asking whether that they have heard the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I believe Paul is probing psychologically, and they don't know the answer to that. Dearly beloved, I want you to consider the time. The book of Acts is the greatest interchange between law and grace. This is why I find it so exciting studying this, this book. Who are you identifying with, man or the Word of God, is what Paul is saying. We are looking at the Holy Spirit working in verse 3. And he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Then then Paul said, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. And all the men were about 12. That takes us up to verse 7. Now, we saw thousands converted. We've seen that in this survey. Did the thousands speak in tongues and prophecy? No, they did not. Do all speak in tongues, says Paul? No, they do not. Chapter 19, verse 8. Paul is at Ephesus. The Holy Spirit has him there in his missionary journeys. And please, please, folks, remember that his missionary journeys were directed to believers. He went around strengthening those who were in the church who were in the faith. Now here he is. Here Paul is in Ephesus. He's in Ephesus for almost three years. And the epistle to the Ephesians is a capstone in the New Testament of the message of the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ. It's in the epistle to the Ephesians that we see the crowning glory of the bride of Christ and the provision that Christ has made for His bride. In chapter 19 at verse 8, He goes into the synagogue and there He speaks boldly for three months disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. The Jews, of course, were looking for the kingdom of God. What they wanted was 
to be delivered from the oppressive rule of, of Rome. What they anticipated was deliverance from their persecutor, their captors. They anticipated a kingdom that was greater in glory than that of Solomon's, that the restoration of Israel's national glory, the Messiah ruling and reigning at Jerusalem and all other nations subservient to them. That's what they were looking for. They had, in fact, had known nothing but captivity, oppression, since they had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar some 600 years before the time of our present study. So they were looking for the kingdom of God, but they were resting in half-truths. And I'm certain that in a great many cases, that's true today, even in our lives. The thing that Paul disputed and persuaded was the same message the Lord Jesus Christ gave that he must suffer and die if there be redemption and restoration for Israel. However, some were hardened and they believed not. And I believe that you have a perfect scriptural illustration of the separation that is spoken of in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 when they believed not and they were hardened. The text goes on to say that Paul then separated uh, the disciples disputing daily in the school of, uh, of Tyrannus. We're not exactly sure what school that is and, and what was taught there, but surely we know that Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, presented the word of truth. He was there for two years and he had been three months here in the synagogue. So two years and three months we know of. And, and I'm sure he had been there sometime before that. So someplace close to three years, Paul was at Ephesus. We have the outstanding statement of the Holy Spirit in verse 10 that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, So I see the Holy Spirit using the Word of God very precisely. I conclude that what the verse says is that all who heard were God's family and every one of them heard. I do not construe the verse to mean that every man, woman, and child in all of Asia heard the Word of the Lord Jesus Christ, both Jew and Greek, but rather all of the family and the household of God heard. They heard without radio, without printing press, without great effort on the part of humans. The Holy Spirit declares in simplicity that in a period of only three years, everybody in, in, that was belonged to God in Asia heard. I believe the scriptures are clear in indicating that God's word is proclaimed to God's people, that we are not living in a time when there are multiplied millions, even what billions, of people who have never heard and who don't have a chance to hear. And there are in those numbers members of the family and the household of God who will go to hell because nobody ever, nobody ever got to them you know, with the truth of the gospel. I do not believe such a thesis can be supported by the Word of God. One man without any radio, without any TV, without any YouTube, without any printing press, without any billboards or, without, or Facebook, or, or in fact, the man was not a national hero, but a condemned criminal. And the Holy Spirit says, all who dwelt in Asia, all who made Asia their home, and, and I believe that the all speaks of the family of God, they all heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. A fabulous statement. What a marvelous thought 
that God knew who these people were. Every one of them. They all heard. Beginning at verse 11, we have the fact that the Lord worked in miracles uh, in Ephesus. Somehow or other, people seem to uh, suggest today, well, you know, or ask, you know, why if, why if He did those things in Ephesus or in Galatia or, or in Thessalonica or in Philippi, well, Steve, why doesn't He do the, those things now? Why were there miracles there and not miracles now? We saw in our study in 1 Corinthians that until the Word of God is complete, God testified to the authenticity of His Word, the message, and the messenger by means of miracles, and that in fact the purpose of miracles in the Word of God is not to impress people, not to show the power of God, but rather to bear the stamp of approval or to place the stamp of approval upon the message and the messenger. I believe the Scriptures are just as clear that, that when God's Word is complete, that stopped, and it did. Well, other than, the, other than charlatans and people who are wrapped up in fleshly, law-centered, legalistic, experience-based feelings, void of, of actual faith. Basically, the age of miracles stopped. I know some of you find that hard to believe, but it did. I suggest you and I are living in a very particular age, the age of grace, which basically amounts to the silence of God. I don't believe that God any longer reveals Himself in miracles and signs and wonders, not to confirm any message. It's, it's different about the signs in the heavens. We're talking about signs that validate the message in the messenger. I've often suggested to you folks that though miracles seem to be a great part of the Christian experience, if you look closely at the Word of God, there aren't many. You know, there was, there was a few during the time of Moses used to deliver the children from the land of Israel or from, from, the, the, from Egypt. A few in the days of Elijah when the, when the nation had so departed from the Lord Jehovah that God needed the stamp of approval on His messenger and, and His message. Some when the Lord Jesus Christ was here and a few during the period of the apostles and that's it. And if you look at the course of human history, one can't say that from God's standpoint that it was replete with miracles. That's not the truth. If you want a miracle today, I can't imagine anything that would surpass the integrity of the Scriptures. And dearly beloved, I would not trade the completed Word of God today for any miracle in the world. To me, the greatest miracle of all time is that I can hold God's Word in my hand and keep it near my heart. And folks, I think it's pretty sad when a Christian suggests that his faith is strengthened if he finds out that, well, by golly, you know, well, there really was a Jericho. You know, oh, or, yeah, the walls did fall down. I mean, where in the world did we get the idea that proving something from history or archaeology is stronger than God saying it? To me, God said it, and that's good enough. I can't imagine anything that would hold a candle to the simple, straightforward statement that God said it. The absence of miracles today to me is a wonderful indication of the completeness of the Word of God, which few people seem to be concerned about, really, truly. They're more interested in looking at the signs, miracles, experiences, there are those who suggest that the Bible is not complete and that there are other revelations. There's the tradition of the church or future revelations and many of the cults are built up around this idea when surely if there is any external evidence of the integrity and the completeness of this book, it's the absence of miracles 
that testify to the authority of the message and the messenger. These were not miracles where someone, you know, I was straight outside the church and, you know, handed out $5 bills to those who threw their crutches away and, and gave testimony to miraculous healings. It goes on every day and sadly, there will always be Christians who don't realize the marvelous truth concerning this. This was God working, folks. And we find that there was a great movement toward the truth of the Word of God. But dearly beloved, they didn't have a book that they could hold like you do. They had a messenger they listened to. And God, God did it this way to validate His message and His messenger. Today, His Word, this book, this Word does that. That's why these things ceased. And that's what we need to understand. In verse 21 of chapter 19, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. <clears throat> now, once again, we come to differences of opinion on these words. As far as the, the life of Paul is concerned, it does not seem to me in any way that God is giving us an account of a man, Paul, and that we're to look at the way Paul lived the things Paul did and try to recognize that Paul is our, our example and, and, and hero and so we ought to be like Paul and, 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 and suddenly Paul insidiously replaces Christ for the glory and the honor of it. it seems to me that any consistent look at the Jesus of the Scriptures would minimize Paul and maximize Christ. There's great argument here as to whether or not Paul has now made a human, fleshly, carnal decision. You know, the argument kind of goes something like this. Uh, God had clearly told Paul that he was to uh, bear testimony to the fact that God had told him that his message was to the Gentiles. Paul's brethren of the Jews, they didn't like this. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, raised in, as a Jew, raised in the Hebrew tradition, still very dear to him, and always in the back of his mind, I believe there was this idea that he'd like to prove once and for all to his brethren at Jerusalem that he was in fact a messenger of the Lord God Jehovah. And even though he knows you know, that God has sent him to the Gentiles, he purposes in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. You know, therefore, it, it, must, it must not have been of the Holy Spirit. It must be, it must be of his own making, his own, his own design, his own will, his own whatever. And we now have a tremendous glimpse into the willful carnality of the Apostle Paul and what it cost him. You know, as, as one Bible teacher uh, said, you know, the minute he got to Jerusalem, he never again preached the Word of God in liberty and freedom. And that's, that's probably true. You know, he preached in, in bonds. He preached in chains, bound in Rome, although he had some measure of freedom. Now, I'm not certain that the reason we're studying the Scripture is to learn that we should not be as willful as was the Apostle Paul. Or that we should find out through great amounts of study that, you know, Paul was a sinner, you know, just like we are. I don't think that's what it says. I am of the conclusion that Paul is going to Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit is sending him to Jerusalem. Now, if you disagree with that, well, you won't be the first, the first person who ever disagree with me. And, it, and it, 
It's not, it won't hurt my feelings. I've spent a good deal of time trying to decide whether it's the Holy Spirit's purpose to show me that Paul was, he was willful and carnal or whether I'm looking here at the direction of the Holy Spirit and the lies of his own. I have to conclude in verse 21 that Paul is constrained by the Holy Spirit to reach the conclusion that he wants to go to Jerusalem, and so he set out to do that. The first thing we'll note in the next chapter or two is that there is no changing in the mind of Paul. If, if this is Paul's decision in verse 21, he surely sticks to it, and he sets out immediately to head for Jerusalem by one route or another. The minute we find uh, this in verse 21, it's followed by a great uproar in Ephesus. Been there for three years. Seems like a long time to wait around for an uproar where some people have reached the conclusion that they're gonna, well, they're gonna be out of work, you know, because the idle business is dropping off. You know, the, the more people that listen to Paul, the fewer there are who buy idols and, and, and you know, all these trinkets. And, and this looks like maybe the end of a profitable trade and surely not doing Diana any good, you know, the God of the Ephesians. And so we have an uproar in the city. You're all well aware of that account, or many of you are. The 22nd verse says that Paul himself stayed in Asia for a season. It could be that it's the Holy Spirit who's driving him out because the Holy Spirit is convincing him that he ought to go to Jerusalem. And the 22nd verse says that he stayed in Asia. And maybe the uproar is not so much an indication of the finishing of, of Paul's ministry because of his stupidity, his carnality, but rather the moving of the Holy Spirit to expedite what he had already indicated to Paul. You'll have to, you'll, you'll have to take it one way or the other. There's an uproar. The people scream out over and over again, great is Diana, uh, you know, the Ephesians, they, they could have taken Paul and done something with him, but he's a, he's a Roman citizen, so they can't really do that. Now they do take they do take Gaius and Aristarchus of Macedonia, Paul's companions, and they, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Paul wanted to go in and quiet down and, and preach to them, but the other disciples wouldn't let him do that. Finally, the magistrate of the city got the people quieted down, pointed out to them that, that Rome might not... Rome may just not like really what y'all are doing, you know, and that the entire city may have to give an account for the uproar that's gone on. You know, there are courts of law. In fact, Rome prides itself in the practice of law, and if they have any dispute, they'd best carry that out legally as they should in the court, and that, that sort of quieted everybody down and and so they were, uh, our text says they were dismissed. And so now we begin chapter 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples, and he embraced them and departed to go into Macedonia. He left after almost three years. We read in verse 2, and when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. It's not so much that Paul went into Macedonia to evangelize millions of lost souls, but to exhort the brethren. To exhort the brother. It seems to me that we have a consistent presentation here that missionary activity as 
when we define missionary activity today is done by the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose. And that the purpose the, the, the Holy Spirit had in Paul and Timothy and Silas and the, and, and the rest was for them to exhort and encourage the brethren. That's what Paul did. He went into Greece. He goes into Greece. And he was there for three months. And the Jews were going to try to take him there. He went into Asia with seven individuals. These going before tarried for us at Troas, verse 6, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and we came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And there in the 20th chapter, beginning verses 6 through 12, we have Paul's long-winded sermon where Eutychus falls out of the window and dies. Eutychus is a very, very common name in scriptures. The Greek word means fortunate. It doesn't seem like he was all that fortunate, does it? The, the Latin word is fortune. And it was a very, very common name in Greece and in Rome. Guy went to sleep. He wasn't a kid. He was an, an adult. The Greek shows that he was an adult, young adult. But he went to sleep. That might indicate the quality of Paul's speaking abilities. I don't know. But there are those who suggest that with all of the burning lanterns and lights that they had, you know, they, they, they didn't have electric lights. You know, it was probably really hot. I mean, you know, the air conditioner didn't work like, you know, like it doesn't do most of the time in my house. Eutychus was there making sure that the windows were open and the guy falls asleep. He drops down three floors. You know, probably the upper chamber was usually the third floor, the second floor being reserved for the servants. So he probably fell three floors to the ground. I have no idea about Paul's speaking abilities that Paul preached till midnight. The text points that out. There are tremendous numbers of questions raised as to why this account is here. We, we have that on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread that Saturday. That got changed to Sunday. That's another video. I believe the breaking of bread is not only physical communion or, or the observance of the Lord's Supper, but is, it is the, the feasting on the Word of God. Feasting on Christ. His work, His person, His work. Then Paul preached unto them because he was going to leave the next day. I have no idea when it started. It started the, the first day of the week. Whether they started service in the morning or in the evening, I don't know. Uh, one normally concludes that they probably started it right after 6 o'clock in the evening. And that went on until midnight. I've been to a few services like that. We know that his speech was contemptible after God had apparently given him a thorn in the flesh. He was, he was not the orator he was at one time. He may have been hard to listen to, but he did go on for a long time. It would seem to me that the reason the account is here is pretty much based upon what Paul must have said. What do you suppose he preached about from something like 6 o'clock in the evening until midnight? Well, surely... It must have been the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ that He was God Almighty, the God Jehovah, the branch, and that He died vicariously, that He rose again from the dead. Now keep in mind, folks, there's no Bible. They had the Old Testament Scriptures, but there were no New Testament Scriptures that anybody could turn to. And it, and it seems as though the Holy Spirit had this young fella fall asleep, drop out the window, drop three floors down to the ground and die and be picked up dead. Picked up dead. I think most every translation says that. 
It doesn't say he was taken up as dead. He was taken up dead. As blunt as that. And that's exactly what the Greek says, that he was not as dead, or, or they thought that he was dead. He was picked up dead. And so they carry him into the house where verse 10, and Paul goes down, he went down and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. His soul has come back. This verse was used many, many years ago to prove that immediately after death, the soul kind of stuck around for a while, you know, before departing for wherever. The Irish have built that into a wake, you know, where the, in order for the soul to be free to go, well, you got to get together, you got to have a party, you got to have a good time. And then, and the more laughter, the more hilarity that there is, the more likely it's that the soul will depart quickly, realizing that there's not a whole lot of sorrow there, so he can go. He can be free to go. I, I don't think there's any indication of that in the scriptures at all. The young man was dead, and his life returned to him, and he rose from the dead. Now, surely, dearly beloved, listen, surely, surely, there was somebody in that upper room that heard Paul preach that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead. Folks, don't fall out a window today or, or go to sleep during one of my videos. Because if you do fall out a window and die, I mean, you're likely to stay dead, okay? All right? Again, God is doing this to confirm His message and His messenger. But it's more than that. Over and over and over again in the book of Acts, we read, and when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some believed, some did not believe. Folks, the warp and the woof of everything we preach is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christianity does not preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not Christianity. You know, you can teach the law of Moses and good old-fashioned morality, but that's not Christianity. Christianity is not a moral ethic. It is not a legalistic system. It is not Ten Commandments of Law, which if you obey, you go to heaven, and, and if you don't, then you, you're banished to hell. Christianity is a relationship to God established by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in your place and His resurrection from the dead. In the first epistle of Romans, the first epistle in the Bible is the book of Romans, and it starts out that He was declared to be the Son of God by what? His resurrection from the dead. Peter writes, we are begotten again unto a, a living hope by His resurrection from the dead. Everything that is properly taught in Christianity is centered in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is not just limited to your new birth, but your walk, your life. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And we have been raised with Him to walk in newness of life. His life. To be sure, you are redeemed because He died in your place. But His death is not sufficient unless He rises from the dead and His resurrection from the dead is the proof that His death is sufficient for your redemption. Sufficient. But His resurrection is also associated with our walk where, where we walk in newness of life, His life as those who were made alive from the dead in Christ. And so everything we believe, everything we believe is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is absolutely necessary as far as my redemption, being certain that 
that Jesus Christ really lived, really died, and really rose from the dead. We have seen in this survey, we've seen in the book of Acts that any time, every, every time the resurrection of Jesus Christ is properly taught, there was always division, hostility, persecution, that His work is sufficient. They want to harm you. God has been testifying to the authenticity of His message in the messenger over and over and over again. I think those who were not fully enlightened to the power of the resurrection of Christ must have been absolutely astounded when Eutychus rises from the dead. Verse 12. They brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. That is to say, they were greatly comforted. I mean, if Eutychus could rise from the dead, surely Christ could. If this could result in life, then what a, a greater testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one could not properly ask, I suppose, the question, you know, you know, hey, that's great for that group, but we haven't had anybody fall out of our window. No, we haven't, but we have the entire Word of God. And once again, I state that I wouldn't change it, not for one minute, not for one second, folks, would I give up this book for that one experience. But I believe Eutychus, was, his experience and his name, fortunate, was used of the Lord as a stamp of approval on the message that was taught that night in that upper room. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 13, we have an account of the journey that led Paul toward Jerusalem. He decides to walk. You know, the other guys, those of his... his uh, his party get on the ship and they're going to sail there. Paul walks some 36 miles. I don't know. I don't know why he walked. The Holy Spirit does not say at all why he had him walk. Uh, I might make a suggestion there, but it's that's all it is. The 14th verse is is an interesting verse, not in the English but in the Greek. It's an imperfect tense, and when he met with us at as Asos, we took him in, and we were about to take him in. It's difficult to translate. Uh, one doesn't know whether there was some hesitation there on the part of Paul's group to receive him, some hesitation on the part of Paul to get on the ship. And now we have the account of, of some of their sailing, and they sailed to these uh, various little ports headed toward Jerusalem because Paul... Paul wanted, if he could possibly do it, he wanted to be at Jerusalem before Pentecost. I think your authorized version uh, says, be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Uh, the Greek would indicate that he wanted to be there in time for the day of Pentecost. So he'd like to arrive sometime before that day. Now he gets close to Ephesus where he had spent almost three years and where he was apparently greatly loved. And so he sends word, uh, word from Miletus. And again, we have a 40 mile trip and the elders of the church come down immediately when they hear that he was there. And we have Paul departing fellowship with those elders of the church at Ephesus. And I think it would be a tremendous testimony if each one of us could reach the end of our road with that kind of a testimony. You know, verse 18, you know, ye know from the first day that I came into Asia after what manner I have been with you at all, all seasons, at all times. 
What a marvelous testimony to say from the very first day in my entire manner of life at all times, you know what kind of a life I lived, what my manner of conversation was. You know that I was serving the Lord with all humility of mind, humbleness of mind. The Word of God is always a, an attitude of the human mind that exalts God. It's, it's not humility as we think of the the English word humility, but consistently in Scripture, humility means to give God the glory, to exalt God rather than man. That's humility. That's what he did. And he did that, the text says, with many tears. Many tears. Somehow it seems to be you know, an easy thing if, if one is sold on the sovereignty of God, and I'll, I, I'll take no second place to anybody on that. I believe my God is sovereign. If that's true, why the tears? Why the tears? We hear the Word of God say, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. That's trials, testings. That's what the Word means. We hear the Holy Spirit have Paul speak. I have learned in whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be content. I don't think in this verse that the tears mean the sufferings. You know, like the, you know, like I was stoned and I was beaten and not left for dead, and I, I don't believe it, it was the suffering, the stoning, the fear of robbery and, and, the, and all the interrogation and the humiliation at the hands of cruel people. I believe the tears that he speaks of here, dearly beloved, are the tears of laboring in the presentation of the Word of God in the presence of much indifference. Might have even been why he walked. Sometimes you just want to be alone. Not that he didn't leave it with the Lord, not at all, but and entering into the ministry of the Word of God where it was total commitment on his part and trials, not only the physical suffering, not only the physical suffering, but the spiritual trials that are accompanied by the lying in wait of the Jews, the legalists, the same kind of difficulty that attacks the Christian today, unless he gives into it. You're as, much as, you're as much the product of suffering on the part of the legalistic so-called Christian community as was Paul. Unless, of course, you don't have a ministry which argues for the sufficiency of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 20, verse 20. 2020. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. I've shown you and taught you publicly. And not only have I taught you publicly, but I've taught from house to house. You didn't even have to come to the synagogue. Willing to do it from house to house. I testified both to Jews and to Greeks. Repentance, that is change of mind, toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. A change of mind. A change of mind toward God based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not acceptance by God is based upon human effort. The Jew by keeping the law, you know, the Gentile by associating himself with that. In every synagogue into which Paul went, there were Gentiles. You know, I suppose we could divide humanity into two great classes of people, those who were, who were of the family of God and those who were of the family of the devil, and, and that would be right. You could also divide humanity into male and female, and that would be right, at least I hope it still is today. We're, we're kind of tink tinkering on something other than that, but that would be right. Those who believe in a God, and, and I use the term very loosely, and those who do not, 
those whose approach to that, that whatever God is, is by morality and human effort to appease an angry God and those, and those who believe that it is by God's grace. And so we have people who approach God through grace and those through effort and those who don't even believe in a God. Those would be, I guess, three broad classes of people. I see no place in the Word of God where there's any effort made toward those who have no interest in God. Nothing to say to them in that book, folks, except judgment and condemnation. And to these Jews and Greeks who believe God is approached by human effort and that God is, is pleased by human effort, Paul says consistently, consistently, both the Jews and the Gentiles, repent. Change your mind toward God. Even faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. If God is approached, it's because Christ died. If God is pleased, it is because Christ died. If God is, if God is approached, it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of our redemption, all of our fellowship, all of our approach to God is implicitly based upon what Christ has done. That's a dramatic change of mind. I mean, for the Jew who knew the law, that's what he testified. And now verse 22. And remember, we had this back, back in, uh, in uh, chapter 19 that Paul purposed in the Spirit, verse 21, to go to Jerusalem. Now we read verse 22, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me. Not knowing the things that shall befall me. This is what he's telling the believers there at Ephesus. What we see is the direction of the Holy Spirit taking Paul to Jerusalem where you have a great testimony to the Jewish believers that are there. However, even though I'm bound in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city and in every place that bonds and afflictions await me. And that's exactly what was to be the case. God had never hid the fact from Paul that he faced suffering. I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So what Paul preached was the person and work of Christ, the Word of God. God also tells, it, he tells us that He's never promised to shield us from pain, suffering, difficulty. What He has promised us is His grace in that hour. If I love you all, I truly do. Rest in Him and keep looking up. I believe we're going home soon. Until next time, Lord willing, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.